Sam Altman had a two-hour interview with Lex Friedman. This was his second interview, and Sam revealed his plans for AGI. If you've been living under an AI rock, Sam is the CEO of OpenAI who created ChatGPT. So AI is changing everything quickly, and Sam told us how quickly things will be going, what to expect, and what will real AI do. So Ray and I will review and discuss this. So let's dive right in. So as usual, of course, Lex Friedman, the interviewer of the age, he's the he's the Elon Musk of interviewers. <laughs> it's so great because he not only brings personality, he not only has great questions, but he's a scientist in his own right. He's an MIT professor and a robotics uh it's his one of his favorite things to do is create robots. So he, he when he talks to Sam Altman, he's talking to Sam Altman as somebody who can talk to at his level. And so the interview is amazing. If you haven't seen this interview yet, you probably want to watch the entire thing. But we're going to pull out some excerpts and we'll take a look at the main things that that Brian took away and probably would have been the same things I would have taken away. Brian, go for it. So if um, when you can let me share the slides. Oh, yeah. Okay. So as I said, the main thing is that AI is changing everything quickly and Sam told us what to, to expect. So the first main thing, which you'll see here, is where Sam says real AGI must change the world and economics and accelerate the rate of science progress. But, you know, if you look at ChatGPT, even 3.5, and you show that to Alan Turing, or not even Alan Turing, people in the 90s, they would be like, this is definitely AGI. Well, not definitely, but there's a lot of experts that would say this is AGI. Yeah, but I don't think chat, I don't think 3.5 changed the world. It maybe changed the world's expectations for the future, and that's actually really important. And it did kind of like get more people to take this seriously and put us on this new trajectory. And that's really important too. So again, I don't want to undersell it. I think it like I could retire after that accomplishment and be pretty happy with my career. But as an artifact, I don't think we're going to look back at that and say hmm. that was a threshold uh, that really changed the world itself. So to you, you're looking for some really major transition in how the world... For me, that's part of what AGI implies. Like singularity level transition? No, definitely not. But just a major, like the internet being like, a, like Google search did, I guess. Uh, what, what was the transition point? Like, does the global economy feel any different to you now or materially different to you now than it did before we uh, launched GPT-4? I, would, I think you would say no. No, no. It might be just a really nice tool for a lot of people to use. It will help you with a lot of stuff, but doesn't feel different. And you're saying that... I mean, again, people define AGI all sorts of different ways, so maybe you have a different definition than I do. But for me, I think that should be part of it. There could be major theatrical moments also. What, what to you would be an impressive thing that AGI would do? Like you are alone in a room with the system. This is personally important to me. I don't know if this is the right definition. I think when a system can significantly increase the rate of scientific discovery in the world, that's like a huge deal. I believe that most real economic growth comes from scientific and technological progress. I agree with you. Hence why I don't like the skepticism about science. And then Sam says he believes AGI will be here, I mean, if not completely, because he's saying it's going to completely change the world. It takes time to change the world. So a lot of it will happen by 2030. He expects huge things to happen by then. Now that is, uh, in we have a couple of different people that have, are making predictions, I guess a lot of people that are making predictions about when AGI will take place. And and Sam, I think, talks about it being uh, definitional. Some people have different definitions of what it really means when AGI takes place. But you're, you've got uh, 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 Elon Musk saying uh, computers will be smarter than any one human by next year and and uh, better than and smarter than all humans combined. Uh, what did he did he say by? 20? He said twenty thirty. He said twenty thirty. All humans combined by twenty thirty. So Sam and Elon, they were used to work together, um, and that was discussed in the interview as well. Right. Um, they're both basically on the same page that if you have AI smarter than all humans by twenty thirty, 
then you very likely change the world. Right. And that was something else in one of the clips that Sam was saying that GPT was great, GPT-4 was great, but if you look in hindsight, because they were on this exponential improvement curve, that it won't look as huge as before. And then he says he didn't want to downplay it, but he totally did downplay yeah. it. Yeah. Saying that our economics have not changed. Our world has not changed. What we've done is it's a good starting point for brainstorming. People are using it for some interesting things. It's good at many things. It's changed the expectations for AI that everyone now realizes, holy F, this is going to be huge, but it has not been actually huge. It's, it's, it's going to be, we see it's going to happen. It's like we see the giant asteroid above us and saying, holy crap, it's huge, but it has not hit us yet. Yeah. So he's saying AGI will hit us. It is huge. You can see it's huge that so we believe him. And then it's going to change the world when it hits us. So That's he says it's going to hit us in 2030 and it's going to be huge. And, and unless it changes how the economics of the world works, that's his bar. Economics of, of the world must change. So after you, you've done it, and it's going to change fast. So like basically looking back in like, you know, a year, it's like, oh, the economics changed and my, and my job wiped out, a lot of jobs wiped out. And the rate of science progress, he also has a factor in it. So some of these things tell us that Sam is hyper competitive. And he... Uh, totally believes in the complete AI thing and that it's going to be every hype thing that people have said, you know, uh, Ray Kurzweil, singularity, change the world. He believes that. He Sam qualifies that he doesn't think the singularity will, will happen, right? totally happen by 2030. But his definition is far stronger than, oh, we get things a little better. No, it's, it's like, his parsing is not quite singularity. So so it's like singularity meaning is like a black hole and we don't even recognize what's happening. He's saying from not recognizing what's happening to everything money-wise, business-wise, all of our day-to-day -day stuff is impacted in a major way. And, you know, so like previous things of like... Um, China economy 10 timing over, over 40 years. This is bigger than that, right? So his level of, of change might be, we go from 3% economic growth per year up to 20%, which we only see for some companies to a worldwide thing. Like, like, Kathy, like, like, like Kathy Wood feels will happen. And it's also right. it's also interesting that the, the two big competitors now, Elon Musk and Sam Altman, that both that Elon Musk says that this will happen because of the humanoid robots that will actually change the economy of the world. Um, and and Sam, on the other hand, is thinking that it will be in within the computers themselves or within the within the applications that the computers can make happen. Um, I'm, I'm sure he does. I'm sure he recognizes that uh, self-driving automobiles and humanoid robots would be part of this impact. But I think he's looking at it more from the standpoint of what will the computer be able to give us? And he mentioned, for instance, when the science, when the computer can actually make scientific inferences that humans can't, that would be one of his evidences. Right. But um, he is not saying he, he's not going to do it also with with robots and with right. cars because right. they're investing in that you know they, they invested in figure ai right so and he says in the interview again that they're definitely looking to get back to the robotics right piece of it. right but it's like he's going to make the ai part insanely good and the the stuff where we saw figure ai understanding what the people were saying understanding the environment I think that was totally the latest open AI GPT handling that communication, right? Because before the investment, before they started working with open AI, they were not talking to their the robot that was making coffee. Right. right. Suddenly you do the deal, $675 million comes in. You can't do something in a week or a month that has an understanding um, 
um, language and stuff. That is totally, I've loaded on the latest GPT and it's understanding language and it's understanding the environment, right? right? That's the, the benefit of OpenAI working on the human and robot with figure. Absolutely. Uh, on the programming front, looking out into the future, how much programming do you think humans will be doing five, 10 years from now? Uh, I mean, a lot, but I think it'll be in a very different shape. Like, you know, maybe some people program entirely in natural language. Entirely natural language. I mean, no one programs like writing bytecode. I mean, some people, no one programs the punch cards anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you can find someone who does, <laughs> but you know what I mean. Yeah, you're gonna get a lot of angry comments. No, no, yeah. There's very few. I've, I've been looking for people who program Fortran. It's hard to find, even Fortran. I, I hear you, but that changes the nature of what the sk the skill set or the predisposition for the kind of people we call programmers. Then changes the skill set. How much it changes the predisposition? I'm I'm not sure. Oh, same kind of puzzle solving, Maybe. all that kind of stuff. You know, the program is hard. It's like how get like that last one percent to. To close the gap, how hard is that? Yeah, I think with most other cases, the best practitioners of the craft will use multiple tools and they'll do some work in natural language and when they need to go, you know, write C for something, they'll do that. So then the, another thing he said, second one was, programming will become entirely natural language. So basically, us as humans talking to a robot, uh, talking to an AI, will be coding, writing the code, which we're kind of, Starting to see that, you know, Devin's the software engineer, um, AI, is doing that for 13% of cases. He thinks it's going to go to like 99% plus, right? So he's very specific about how that will be. So right now, if you're in a company with a bunch of programmers and domain knowledge experts who know about the accounting and the finance, the domain knowledge experts will then be talking to the AI and it will then generate the 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 system from it to, right. to make the code, right? So that's what he's saying. Co so people won't have to learn how to code. They can just talk to it and then the code will be made. But you have to talk precisely to say, here's exactly what I want, right? So there'll be some nuance. The, the, the AI, if it's smart, would then be able to say, you kind of want this, kind of want that, you know, let's, let's um, figure out what, what you're talking about. So they'll be in a conversation to get that precision. Exactly, exactly. But he did talk about under some pushback from Lex that maybe 1% you'll need the coding superstars right. to come in and do something at the at the base level. Let me ask you, um, Google, with the help of search, has been dominating the past 20 years. I think it's fair to say in terms of the access, the world's access to information, how we interact and so on. And... One of the nerve wracking things for Google, but for the entirety of people in the space is thinking about how are people going to access information? Yeah. Like like you said, people show up to GPT as a yeah. as a starting point. So is OpenAI going to really take on this thing that Google started 20 years ago, which is how do we get- I find that boring. I, I mean, <laughs> if, if, the, if the question is, is like, is if we can build a better search engine than Google or whatever, then sure, we should like go, you know, like people should use a better product. But I think that would so understate what this can be. You know, Google shows you like 10 blue links, well, like 13 ads and then 10 blue links. And that's like one way to find information. But the thing that's exciting to me is not that we can go build a better copy of Google search, but that maybe there's just some much better way to help people find and act and on and synthesize information. I actually, I think ChatGPT is that for some use cases. And One of the other things, third point, was that he, he was asked about Google's Gemini uh, AI and their search. And Sam just went to, OpenAI is focused on doing search with AI, making that really, really good, which I interpret as we're focused on taking search from Google. <laughs> so they're working wow. with, with Microsoft, with, with um, Bing, and Microsoft, because things are basically OpenAI and Microsoft are like one. And their big goal is crush Google. <laughs> and so Sam didn't even like beat around with, oh, it's like, we're working on it. We want it, you know, he's smiling and saying, you know. 
He did. He did say, it. however, that for him, that's the boring part. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He said, he said that's the boring part. I guess they'll let Microsoft handle that. So from his side of the coin, though, he was saying, being completely changing the way that people approach certain projects, mm -hmm. or completely changing the way that ChatGPT brings you the results that would cause you not to need a Google search. So right. those are the things that are exciting to him. He said those are like top of top of the list for him. Is right. how do you go into ChatGPT, prompt it the right way, and it'll, and it gives you the opportunity to get way better and faster and more interesting results than you would through search. Right. This does make me think of the mysterious, the lore behind QSTAR. <laughs> What's this mysterious Q-Star project? Is it also in the same nuclear facility? Uh, there is no nuclear facility. Mm -hmm. That's what a person with a nuclear facility always says. I would love to have a secret nuclear facility. <laughs> there isn't one. All right. Uh, Maybe uh, someday. Someday? All right. <laughs> one can dream. Open AI is not a good company at keeping secrets. It would be nice. You know, we're like been plagued by a lot of leaks and... And it would be nice if we were able to have something like that. Can you speak to what QSTAR is? We are not ready to talk about that. See, but an answer like that means there's something to talk about. It's very mysterious, Sam. So the next clip is where Sam refused to talk about QSTAR. What do I take away from this? QSTAR was supposed to be what triggered the um, boardroom battle where they tried to fire Sam. And then they couldn't fire Sam, they brought him back. But then QSTAR was a thing that supposedly um, shocked uh, their top um, chief technology officer scientist, Ilya. And um, so him still not being able to talk about the details of QSTAR means that the rumors were real. It is something hugely impactful. And what they hinted at was probably the breakthrough in reasoning in some way. So the takeaway is we still don't know what it is, but it was it is a real thing. It right. is something huge. Look, I think compute is going to be the currency of the future. I think it will be maybe the most precious commodity in the world. And I think we should be investing heavily to make a lot more compute. Um, compute is... It's an unusual... I think it's going to be an unusual market. Um, you know, people think about the market for, like, chips for mobile phones or something like that. And you can say that, okay, there's 8 billion people in the world. Maybe 7 billion of them have phones. Maybe they are 6 billion, let's say. They upgrade every two years. So the market per year is 3 billion system on chip for smartphones. And if you make 30 billion, you will not sell 10 times as many phones because most people have one phone. Um but compute is different. Like intelligence is going to be more like energy or something like that, where the only thing that I think makes sense to talk about is at price X, the world will use this much compute, and at price Y, the world will use this much compute. Mm -hmm. um, because if it's really cheap, I'll have it like reading my email all day, like giving me suggestions about what I maybe should think about or work on, and trying to cure cancer. And if it's really expensive, maybe I'll only use it or will only use it to try to cure cancer. So. I think the world is going to want a tremendous amount of compute. And there's a lot of parts of that that are hard. Uh, energy is the hardest part. Building data centers is also hard. The supply chain is hard. And then, of course, fabricating enough chips is hard. Um, but this seems to me where things are going. Like, we're going to want an amount of compute that's just hard to reason about right now. He also said, watch here, what will be the most valuable things in the AI world? So we heard from that that it was compute, energy, and AI data centers. So basically, it all goes back to compute and, and, and energy. So we, we, we need them as much compute as we can because more compute makes the AI better. So here are some, some several important deductions that I make from what he said there. Is that NVIDIA will keep selling as many chips as they can. NVIDIA just um, announced their B200 chip, five times better four times better than the um, H100 chips, the most recent one. And then in six months, they'll announce the X100. So, And we will have a show coming up on that NVIDIA conference 
uh, where we'll take a look at what was said there. Hugely impactful conference, and we want to bring that to you. Right. So, but he says the most valuable thing will be compute, and then the next thing will be energy, and because energy will limit how much compute we have. So that means anyone who thinks, oh, NVIDIA won't sell that, that many chips, or we won't need that many, that we'll do an upgrade, and then that'll be it. Sam is saying AI will still scale with compute. We still need more and more compute, and we can't have enough compute. He can't have enough compute, right? So he's saying that um, Zuckerberg has stepped up to $10 billion. Kuwait, Saudi, they're talking about spending $100 billion. He, Sam did say the $7 trillion thing was BS, yeah. um, but who knows, right? And so it, all those people who say that, you know, early stage, we won't need that much, they are wrong, right? And he, also, he also said that he's all for nuclear, uh, he's all for fission, our fusion. fusion. Yeah, fusion, fusion, yeah. Fusion, our fusion. Um, feels like uh, that Elon is on the right track with the batteries. I mean, so so he he was very well aware of all the energy aspects and uh, and brought his put his thumb on the scale in terms of all of the above. Right. So so something that people may not know is that the underlying physics of computing mean that as efficient as they make the chip and they you know make uh, the B100 25 times more efficient. There's a fundamental physical limit below which you cannot get more computing without using up more energy. So energy and compute are very closely tied. You can try and get it more efficient, but you hit a limit. And then if I want more compute, I then fundamentally need more energy, right? And if I, if he's saying that the compute limits and energy limits will persist forever, then, he didn't say forever, but basically that's implying that it, right. we will keep wanting more. The most valuable thing is this, we will keep wanting more compute. He will keep wanting more compute. So he's a leader. So then everyone else, if they say, I don't know how to use more compute, right? That means you're behind and you don't know, right? It doesn't mean that, oh, I'm going to be more efficient. I'm going to be figuring out how, how to, you know, to do it. It's like, if, you know, in World War II, Germany's fighting uh, the West and they're saying, do I really need the oil in, in Russia? Maybe I can get away with more efficiency. I don't need it, right? <laughs> you don't try and make that kind of mistake, yeah. right? It's like, I need more of the energy. I need more compute. And they're showing with the scaling that they need more. Right. right. That that and you will keep needing more. So one, so this is a, will be a fundamental truth of it. You need more compute and you need more energy. A million times more, a billion times more, you will always be wanting more. And your AI will get better, a lot better, when you have more compute and more energy. How does this there's a few people who have to like think about putting the whole thing together, but a lot of people try to keep most of the picture in their head. Oh, like the individual teams, individual contributors try to keep At a high picture. level, yeah. I mean, you don't know exactly how every piece works, of course, but one thing I generally believe is that it's sometimes useful to zoom out and look at the entire map. And, and I think this is true for, like, a technical problem. I think this is true for, like, innovating in business. Uh, but things come together in surprising ways, and having an understanding of that whole picture even if most of the time you're operating in the weeds in one area, pays off with surprising insights. In fact, one of the things that I used to have and I think was super valuable was I used to have like a a, a good map of that all of the frontier or most of the frontiers in the tech industry. And I could sometimes see these connections or new things that were possible that if I were only, you know, deep in one area, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to like have the idea for it because I wouldn't have all the data. And I don't really have that much anymore. I'm like super deep now. So the last point is not a, a broader impact related to the world, but it's one that relates to, to me. Sam said, you can hear, he used to look, 
have, have a, a look at a, a technological frontier map. He had in his own mind, because he was looking at hundreds of startups, talking about what's the latest in all technology, he had a technology frontier map. And that his map and the out of date, because he had to go all in on AI, but it was very useful. So I just want to say that Next Big Future provides everyone with a technology frontier map. That is one of the things that I do is to look at all the technology, all the linear stuff. Of course, just like Sam, AI and certain other things are taking over this thing, but the technology map is still relevant. Yeah. So was there anything else that, that you uh, found in the... Um, Talk, yeah, I think I think it's a broader a broader issue, uh, not so much what I did find, but taking what you have just talked about, what was also talked about at the conference in the keynote uh, at Nvidia, taking into consideration the things that Elon is doing with robots, in particular with regard to humanoids, but even broader, because he, he, Elon even hinted the other day at something that was said at the Nvidia conference and that's backed up by Sam. Everything is going. Everything that moves is going to be roboticized. That's what they said at the NVIDIA conference. Sam is saying everything that doesn't move is going to have an AI component. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so even the things that don't move, everything is going to be changed. And I think that's what we talk about the economy being truly changed. Well, the opportunities for 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 even old people like you and me, but certainly for young people right now, they're like, well, what's my job going to be? What am I going to do in the future? Well, there's going to be so many products, so many things that are just normal stuff that I saw yesterday. Um, a, a, a yard trimmer is, is, is getting AI. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So every product out there, you can just, maybe my electric shaver, you know, is going to have an AI function. You got right now where your mind should be going is kind of like the 90s when the internet came out and everybody's mind went to what kind of an app can I create? And that hasn't stopped for 25 years. People are still like, what kind of app can I make? Well, it's going to be now it's going to be how can I apply those applications? How can I apply those applications to the AI world and also more of the physical world in terms of integrating it into bots? And the thing is, if things get really fast and really crazy with with AI, the faster the world gets, the more there will be gaps and opportunities, huge gaps and opportunities, like suddenly things are splitting apart, and then you have to bridge the gap. So you have to be looking at the flaws, because there will be flaws, because th things don't get perfect right away. They'll be like, I need to do this, and it's racing at a uh, thousand miles per hour. You think, well, I have to look ahead of it. As fast as it is, you still have to be looking ahead using a technology frontier map to say, where is this going to go? What's the end state? One of the things that they said they really loved about Ilya, they both, Lex and Sam said it, is that he can go from first principles and project out 10 years. That's what we need to do to be successful, is that we need to go from first principles. What is physics? What is um, the fundamental of, of science or AI or whatever, and then where does this go? If I can do this and I go at this rate, where do I end up in 10 years? That is where the opportunities are. That if I'm, you know, merging together DNA and genetics and all that kind of stuff, how, what is the opportunity there? Because there are huge opportunities because the more power we get from AI and compute, the more energy we have, the less we're limited in what we can do. But the thing is, as I expand my capabilities and say, okay, now what was impossible before, like going from cavemen with sticks and fire to people now with bulldozers and um, other construction equipment, your capability um, space has expanded. So then, but as the expansion occurs, suddenly something that was impossible and important comes into the ICC. see what's just beyond the edge. What and how can I cheat to get it's just be on the edge, but um, if I just wait, yes, I get there. But are there ways that I can cheat to enable me to do that thing or part of that thing? Right. S same thing for things like uh, self-driving cars or or um, the, the human robot is like, what can I do that is super useful with the human robots? 
that even if they're not quite perfect yet, mm -hmm. right? If, yep. if I can, you know, I do it in the factory. I can control what the situation is. I can narrow up the problem, right? I can add in some extra location information sensors or some other, other sensors to do it. Although cheating too much, maybe with LIDAR or other things, may not be the best move. But you have to make that decision yourself as to what is the right way to do it? Do I do some cheating? Should it, and, but also the things like, you know, data dependence. How do I get more data? So I, as I'm working towards it, I keep getting more information, which is what um, is good for Elon and good for Sam and others is they're working towards audacious goals and they're getting more and more power and capability on their path. Sam keeps getting more money, keeps getting better products, getting more people involved. And then it gets better and better so that he's in the lead position. It's not just him spending money. It's I'm spending money that, that gets me more capability, more data, more compute, uh, better programming. You know, I'm, I'm building up my, um, my stack of, of capability towards reaching, surmounting that, that uh, big goal. And for those of you who are entrepreneurial or who are managerial and you're you're looking for these opportunities in a world that's rapidly changing, your goals do not have to be as audacious as Sam's or our our Ilya's, our our Elon's, our Jensen's. You know, they can be um much smaller. Uh, you know, and there's opportunities. If you have a company that does a few million dollars in sales, believe me, you're going to be pretty well off. <laughs> and maybe you're going to find a great deal of satisfaction in, in building that small business. I've built a bunch of them in my life, and I can tell you it's extremely satisfying. So, Brian, this is, uh, I think, super valuable stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we will, again, have uh, have uh, uh, another show probably tomorrow or the next day where we're going to be talking about what happened at that NVIDIA conference, which was also absolutely mind-blowing. Okay, thank you. All right, and it's been nice talking to y'all. <laughs>